Good evening, and welcome to the inaugural lecture in our spring uh, lecture series. It's my great pleasure to introduce Bridget Shim, a co-founding partner along with Howard Sutcliffe of the world-renowned Toronto-based Shim Sutcliffe Architects. So for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Eric Bungay. I teach design studios in both the core sequence and option studios. But first, tonight we gather in Lenape Hoking, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their traditional territory, elders, ancestors, and future generations, and in acknowledging as a school that Columbia, like New York City and the United States as a nation, was founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. GSAP is committed to addressing the deep history of erasure of indigenous knowledge in the professions of the built environment generally, and in the Western tradition of architectural education specifically. With this, GSAP commits to confronting these institutional legacies as agents of colonialism and to honoring indigenous knowledge in its curricula. So I'm delighted to have been asked to introduce Brigitte's uh, lecture and respond to it for a number of reasons. Um, for one, as a fellow Canadian, uh, though long displaced, I suppose I've been called as a sort of witness who can testify to the importance of Shim Sutcliffe's work in Canada and the larger than life presence of Brigitte herself a voice that resonates from practice to academia and beyond to her generous service to the discipline as a frequent juror, board member and design review committee member. Um, it's perhaps not that meaningful to someone outside the Canadian context to say that Shim Sutcliffe has won a total of 15 Governor General's medals in architecture over the course of their career. Um, they're not quite like the Grand Slam, but these awards are similar to the AIA National Award. It's very special for any firm, let alone a small firm, to receive that many. And it's a testament to the importance of their work in Canada. Um, last year, Shim Sutcliffe won the Royal Architecture Institute of Canada's 2021 gold medal. That's analogous to the AIA's own gold medal, Canada's most prestigious award. Uh, but a second more important reason for my delight in welcoming Brigitte uh, to Columbia will be evident once you've had a chance to better understand the exquisitely, exquisitely conceived architecture of Shim Sutcliffe. Their work stands out as a bulwark of invention and craft at a time of ever increasing commercialization of the construction industry and as a practice deeply rooted in a place and at a time to a place at a time of globalization and placelessness. As such, their work is woven into a dialogue not only with materials, fabricators, technology, and landscapes, but with architectural history and culture it itself. Bridget and Howard draw from the, and playfully continue the work of architects they have referred to as transitional, including the work of Alvar Alto, Sigurd Leverance, Gunnar Asplund, uh, Carlos Garpa, and Adolf Loos, to name a few, but while clearly articulating their own consistent voice. But a third and more fundamental reason for my delight in welcoming Bridget this evening emerges from the humanism of her practice, an aspect not only of their work, but of their generous interaction with the many people who make their work possible, from clients to collaborators to builders. It's so incredible to see how the credits of their projects will include like the master carpenter or uh, a metal worker. Um, how many architects even know the name of their carpenter on the, on the job sites? My partner Mimi and I felt this generosity personally when we visited their now uh, canonical integral house about 15 years ago when, when it was under construction. Um, as out of town guests, we were treated to a nice office lunch and an unhurried conversation about architecture. Coming from New York City, who has the time? Um, so we came away humbled, not only by the mastery we witnessed on site, but the humanism of Bridget and Howard's approach to life and architecture. And it's this humanism that is in such short supply today, hence the urgency of this lecture tonight. In addition to forming Shin Sutcliffe Architects in 1994, Bridget is a professor at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto, where she has taught since 1988. She has overseen core design studios, advanced design studios, thesis studios, and courses in the history and theory of uh, architecture and landscape architecture. Born in Kingston, Jamaica, Shim graduated from the University of Waterloo with degrees in environmental studies and architecture. In addition to teaching at Daniels, Bridget has been an invited visiting professor at Yale, the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, and the Cooper Union. After her 45 minute lecture, please stay for a short discussion, which will be followed by Q&A. Please join me remotely and virtually in welcoming Bridget Shim. Thank you. 
Uh, so thank you for your kind introduction, Eric, <clears throat> and I look forward to sharing our work with you. <clears throat> um, I want to thank Columbia and its dynamic faculty and students for your invitation. <clears throat> and really all of the work that I'm going to share is a collaboration between myself and my partner, Howard Sutcliffe. Uh, we started our practice in 1994. <clears throat> we work in a renovated garage in Toronto, Canada. <clears throat> and uh, I'll just start with uh, sharing my screen and uh, begin with the lecture. So. <clears throat> okay, so I hope you can see the first slide. <clears throat> uh, I think as <clears throat> Eric mentioned, the kind of, uh, there's for us an interest <clears throat> in, um, I would say the material manifestation of culture, place, and time. <clears throat> and we really believe that architecture has the capacity <clears throat> to speak eloquently about who we are as a society and what we value. <clears throat> um, so, uh, and again, within the complexities of these crazy global economies <clears throat> and these quickly changing cultural conditions, <clears throat> in our studio, we believe that the value of architecture as a cultural force <clears throat> uh, enables us to shape places that resonate and have meaning. So within this kind of world of placelessness, we are really committed to place making and cra crafting place, which is the title of this talk, is really at the core of our body of work. And for us, crafting place results from, for the, from the interweaving of building and site. So uh, can you see the screen? Yes, it looks good. Okay, great. <clears throat> so the first image that I showed you is actually a view from a portion of a facade situated in a Russian forest on the outskirts of Moscow. <clears throat> Crafting place really requires the understanding of geomorphology, geography, local economies, local methods of fabrication to realize built form that really resonates with a place. <clears throat> In this pine forest that we're building in, it's located at 54 degrees latitude in a seasonal climate. <clears throat> the prevalent tree in this forest is a Scots pine or a Baltic pine that's really native to this part of Eurasia. <clears throat> These trees have a kind of scaly brown, dark gray bark, and they're really uh, quite remarkable because the mature tree is extremely straight and tall with most of the mass of the foliage being at the very top of the tree with very little understory. So this is a photo uh, at the top taken in the springtime and in the bottom taken in the middle of winter. <clears throat> and in a way, uh, you know, this is kind of the starting point for this project. In Russia, there's a really, really rich history of brick as a material and many of the buildings in the core of Moscow, including the Kremlin and all of its fortifications are made of brick. <clears throat> so we worked with a company called Pedersen Tegel and we designed 22 custom shapes for this project. We were able to mix the bricks. So really using some bricks that had sandblasted surfaces, glazed surfaces, plain surfaces, <clears throat> and that mix of bricks enabled us to situate a new building within an existing pine forest with the hope of feeling like it belongs to that place. <clears throat> this is a view of some of the bricks. <clears throat> and in a way, the kind of uh, bricks helped us to create an undulating curtain of brick inspired by the sapling trees found in this existing forest. <clears throat> Many architects claim to be interested in materials, but we, Howard and I, feel that the choice of materials is a fundamental decision for every project that really sets up this material manifesto that is so fundamental to the, to the relationship between place, geography, and site. And it really enables us to kind of be of that place. So we always imagine ourselves uh, at the time of a project asking whether it will be a good ruin. And if it's a good ruin, it might have the potential to be a good building. So this role of time and aging and the forces of nature and how they act on buildings is really an important consideration for us in every project that we do. <clears throat> this is a full-size mock-up of this kind of brick <clears throat> facade. And we actually built this on the site with the actual bricks. <clears throat> so we were pairing a handmade organic brick with laser cut precise pieces of horizontal weathering steel. 
<clears throat> the steel acts as snow catchers in the middle of the winter. <clears throat> and this full size mock up was exposed over several seasons to really understand the impact of aging and weathering. <clears throat> we were able to monitor and observe the calculated provocation of intensity between the wild and unpredictable forces of nature <clears throat> and the controlled precision of contemporary fabrication. <clears throat> this dialectic helps us to address universal issues of architecture while building in local conditions that are grounded by latitude and longitude, by climate, geomorphology, and place. <clears throat> For us, drawing is a fundamental dim dimension of our practice, enabling us to question and test and re-examine aspects of our work. This drawing shows a portion of the main elevation and the articulated shaped bricks that form the building facade. So here we are at 54 degrees latitude in a climatic zone, and you can see this kind of relationship between the really uh, precise horizontals made of weathering steel, creating the framework for the handmade bricks itself. And on the left, you can see a kind of typical tree from this forest, this kind of scaly brown bark. <clears throat> And then we actually created a series of fins that allow portions of the facade to levitate. And then in a way, this project is not complete, so I'm not gonna show you final photos, but we're always trying to create the illusion that the building has always been on the site, contributing in effect to placemaking and being able to insert new buildings into places where they should belong. Let's say the fabrication of materials and their eloquent assembly is an essential dimension of our definition of architecture. <clears throat> this is a photograph of Howard in a, in a shop flame cutting a piece of a weathering steel roof for one of our early projects. <clears throat> and here's a view of that flame cutted piece. <clears throat> and this was photographed uh, three decades after it was completed. Again, questioning whether a building will become a good ruin, and if it's a good ruin, maybe it's a good building. The role of the full-size mock-up is really fundamental in our practice. Anytime you step outside of the norms of kind of everyday uh, specifications of building systems, <clears throat> the mock-up is really an essential part of testing the unknown and enabling us to really experiment in our work. We love exploring different materials, understanding their properties, their potential, and we work with many fabricators who enable us to realize our ideas and transform a sketch or a drawing into built work. So this is a view of the mock-up, and here's a view of the project that it's for. This is called the Weathering Steel House, and, and in a way, the kind of mock-up is one portion of this facade that was really trying to understand methods of fabrication, installation, uh, and the appearance. <clears throat> Many of our projects are small in scale, but they need to claim a much larger territory through an active engagement of both architecture and landscape. This is a very Canadian condition given the scale of our country. And so no matter how big a building it is, it actually seems quite small in relation to the landscape. <clears throat> We're always interested in blurring the boundaries between inside and out. In this view of the same project, we're really creating a new foreground through our architecture. So we're using profilate industrial glass cantilevered out to create a covered outdoor area, which allows you to view a natural Toronto ravine in the distance. <clears throat> Light is a, it, and its ability to capture or harness its power is a preoccupation in our built work. This is a study model for a synagogue that we did in Portland, Maine. And it's really there to just think about light and to understand how to utilize it and harness it. <clears throat> We're always trying to amplify our winter light and shade ourselves against the harsh summer light. In Toronto, we're at 43 degrees latitude. <clears throat> In this project for a summer camp for a nonprofit, we're really trying to register the time of day. We're using off the shelf greenhouse glazing combined with glue lamp frames and metal tie rods. And then down the center are two by fours, really very elemental uh, part of our construction industry. <clears throat> and it's really there to connect light and natural ventilation. In this recent project, we use a series of Douglas fir clad trusses combined with clear story windows to help us shape space through light. This is in a project called the Lake Coagama Retreat. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so we really live in Toronto in a seasonal climate. <clears throat> And we want to harness light as a force to help us continually recalibrate our understanding of place and context. As architects, we want to paint with light. So this is a view of the integral house that Eric referred to in the winter. <clears throat> and you can see this low sun angles, which are really a result of this kind of amazing winter light and how we use these deep uh, wooden fins to really help us to shape the space through light. <clears throat> We also uh, want to bring um, nature into our projects. <clears throat> uh, in the Toronto ravines, the black locust, which is found in many of our ravines, is one of the most predominant tree species, <clears throat> which is part of the virgent, uh, verdant Carolinian forest. <clears throat> so this is a view of the project, a project where we actually used the leaf pattern of the black locust to really uh, create privacy while still having views out. <clears throat> Linking light and nature is an ongoing interest. So the only color that you see in this difference between the previous slide and this one is actually the fall leaves that help to literally transform the space through the seasons. So you can see that nature and culture are always interwoven together in our work. <clears throat> Water is another life force that we use to craft place in our work. This is a view of a project called Ledbury Park, and we designed a pedestrian bridge using off the shelf weathering steel elements that was fabricated off site and brought on site. And then you can see a skate change pavilion. On the left is a garage for the Zamboni machines and then a reflecting pool. This is another view of that same area and in the far distance is actually a public swimming pool. <clears throat> Another project, uh, this is the Weathering Steel House, where you can see the linking of a natural pool with water lilies and then a, a swimming pool, but they really appear to be visually connected. And the same view in winter, and we love the use of winter water in our climatic zone. <clears throat> it allows us to register subtle shifts of temperature through states of change from steam to mist to ice. And these things are so uh, fleeting and the way that water is able to register them we feel is so special. <clears throat> we really embrace the delight of winter water in intimate small spaces. <clears throat> and we really celebrate winter as a season. This is a view of a Toronto ravine and you can see a lone cross country skier in the, at the bottom of the image. <clears throat> we just had a huge uh, snowstorm. Uh, a few days ago, and in a way it was remarkable to watch the city transform. <clears throat> we love winter as a season, and uh, we're really obsessed with thinking about our buildings in every season. Maybe it was because I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and we arrived in February in the middle of a snowstorm. Uh, <clears throat> So the role of winter water in the public realm is an ongoing investigation. This is a small fountain <clears throat> at uh, Ledbury Park. And then the same reflecting pool actually transforms to become a skating rink in the winter. This is a very early project, the Orchard House. <clears throat> so it's a plywood house inserted into an existing apple orchard. And we actually got our photographer to come out in a snowstorm to uh, shoot the project. <clears throat> and then we love this view from the kitchen sink where you're really situated in the apple orchard. And this, uh, we're always thinking about our projects from the outside in and from the inside out. <clears throat> our work is an ongoing laboratory for living and we're always experimenting with new ideas and pushing limits to discover new ways of inhabiting space. <clears throat> In parallel with buildings, we have realized about 50 objects, including furniture, lights, door handles, boat cleats, pedestrian bridges, <clears throat> and we're really interested in the way that through their eloquent, eloquent assembly, <clears throat> these inert materials, wood, brick, steel, concrete, are able to speak. Uh, this is just a double spread <clears throat> of a whole series of different prototypes. Some are done by hand, some are 3D modeled. Uh, we've been doing a lot of 3D printing in bronze and stainless steel. <clears throat> and this kind of experimentation happens in every project in different scales. But this just gives you a kind of uh, sense of the kind of range of ongoing investigations. Uh, <clears throat> 
We explore work at the scale of landscape, at the scale of architecture, and at the scale of furniture. <clears throat> this is a kind of view from uh, the fabrication shop of me and Camper, who fabricate and distribute this chair. You're seeing a, a cardboard prototype. <clears throat> we worked with them to create vacuum form plywood molds that become the template for the chair. And then here is an elevation of the chair itself. So you can see that it's actually maple wood combined with a stainless steel frame. <clears throat> and then here you can see uh, on the left, a kind of uh, metal version of that same chair. And on the right, one of our firefly lamps. This is a series of boat cleats where you can see <clears throat> a cardboard mock-up on the left a sand casting, and then a bronze, the final version in bronze with an off-the-shelf stainless steel shackle. <clears throat> Alvar Alto considered the door handle as the handshake of a building, and we've been designing custom hardware for many of our projects. <clears throat> we're really interested in rethinking the role of craft in architecture, and we're at an amazing moment where the possibilities of computer fabrication using 3D printing <clears throat> can actually change the level of craft that's possible, affordable, and actually doable. <clears throat> so here you're seeing a door handle on the very far left is actually uh, done out of uh, a plasticine. <clears throat> then, then the next one in from the left is actually uh, made out of wood and then it gets digitized. And then the gray and the white version are 3D prints in plastic. <clears throat> and then the last two on the right are 3D prints in bronze. And here you can see a whole series of other experiments uh, and the kind of way that we think about the right kind of material for a specific project. Uh, <clears throat> we also love uh, 3D printing in plastic. <clears throat> so in a way for this project, we were inspired by the powerful Inuit sculptures in the Canadian Arctic that often use whale vertebrae as a medium for carving. <clears throat> and we created a 3D printed lamp where the light, the plastic, the light is transmitted through the plastic as if it were being transmitted through the whalebone itself. And here's a view of that light in a meeting room that we designed in Hong Kong. <clears throat> we love developing uh, these custom pieces and we love combining uh, both customized elements and ready-made pieces. So this uh, sketch is using a ubiquitous mason jar, uh, which is everywhere for pickling and preserving uh, with a series of mylar shapes to create a new light. And this is the, the prototype of that light, which is really a, an experiment. There is only one of these that exists. And then we develop that light further and actually transform the mason jar into scientific glass, combined it with bronze mesh and created a series of organic resin shaped pieces with the phosphorescent powder. So when you turn the light off, there's actually a glow. <clears throat> and we love the kind of use of this kind of uh, elements that you do when you're a kid at your summer cottage, <clears throat> catching fireflies in a jar and creating a sense of wonder and delight, which we love to do at every scale. <clears throat> uh, so that's just a long introduction and it gives you a sense of some of the things that interest us. For this lecture, I, I thought what I would do is share a very selected number of projects. Uh, the first will be a Taoist temple in suburban Toronto, <clears throat> then a home for Catholic nuns at the edge of a Toronto ravine, uh, and then um, a project <clears throat> on the Canadian Shield, <clears throat> a series of buildings on a kind of exposed, rugged piece of rock. <clears throat> And then the last project is an urban hotel in downtown Toronto that is not quite finished yet, but we have some great construction photos. So, uh, so I'll just uh, start. Uh, this is the Wang Dai Sin Temple, which is a really a modern sacred space that houses a very dynamic Taoist community. Uh, so in the outskirts of Toronto, on the other side of the street, there's a strip mall, a gas station, and, and here is this uh, temple. Uh, a place of worship on a suburban arterial road <clears throat> is a kind of challenge. And what does a kind of uh, Taoist temple look like? Um, so here you can see that we actually have two very large cantilevers. The one on the left where all the people in yellow are <clears throat> is actually a uh, 
10.2 meter uh, cantilever. <clears throat> and then on the other side, there's a 5.2 meter cantilever and a series of structural uh, supports. <clears throat> and then a, a, long, a kind of large uh, grade beam at the bottom. This is all post-tension concrete <clears throat> and all of the metal is weathering steel. So here you can see a section where you can see the 10.2 meter cantilever, the 5.2, <clears throat> and then the raft foundation. So the dotted lines <clears throat> below is actually a, a kind of huge raft that supports and anchors the two, the two post-tension cantilevers. <clears throat> and part of this kind of um, uh, structural virtuosity <clears throat> is to really create a series of uh, parking spaces below the building and when we were working with the client, we had some early sketch models and they love the fact that the cantilever created something akin to a Tai Chi pose, something that was asymmetrical, counterbalanced, but also in equilibrium at the same time. <clears throat> so it allowed us to, to meet these stringent parking requirements for a place of worship uh, near a residential neighborhood. <clears throat> And we uh, were able to also uh, utilize the space for doing Tai Chi outside in the, in the summertime. <coughs> uh, the building's exterior on the north and south facades is clad in shaped weathering steel. So through this section, you can see the way that uh, we've shaped the steel. And then you can also see these uh, circular skylights that provide natural light in the space. And they're all operable, um, motorized to create really good cross ventilation. <coughs> so here's a view in the uh, of the cantilever. <clears throat> and this is a view from the north side, looking back to the street. And then here is a view uh, uh, on the west elevation facing the neighbors and it's really a kind of blank wall ensuring privacy. But you can see through to the structure and you can see these uh, paired uh, concrete uh, structural frames that actually support the project and the two cantilevers on either side. And here's another view. <clears throat> this is the concrete related to the stair on the second floor. And then we've carved out openings to provide views uh, and light to come down to this lower level. And here's another view of these paired concrete uh, uh, fins <clears throat> that actually are tied together through the raft foundation. And this is the second cantilever in the foreground that is acts as the counterweight for the larger cantilever. <clears throat> There's an entrance canopy that denotes the main entrance to the space. And then here is one of the outdoor terraces and you can see the way we've used structural glass on the floor to bring light into the lower level. And then once you're inside, you can see these circular <clears throat> uh, light monitors that we created. And they uh, both uh, bring natural light into the space and they are used to hang these large coils of incense that they burn all the time. And then above these light monitors are motorized skylights that all open up and they can ventilate the space really easily. Uh, <clears throat> so what happens is they, they'll be burning all of the incense all of the ashes drop to the floor, it's a concrete floor, and then they can sweep them all up and it's really part of their uh, uh, daily ritual. There's an interior space that is actually all done in bamboo and it is their memorial hall and it's where they uh, honor their ancestors. So these bamboo plaques are used and they all have carvings on them and names of your ancestor and you will go there and uh, <clears throat> burn incense to honor your loved ones. And here you can see these fins on the exterior that are really shaped to provide privacy and also create cross ventilation on the inside with these large floor to ceiling windows. And then they use the space in the summertime for Tai Chi in a covered outdoor area. And here you get a sense of the kind of concrete on the underside of these post-tensioned uh, uh, concrete cantilevers. <clears throat> The next project is built for a group of Catholic nuns. Uh, they're, sorry, they're called the Sisters of St. Joseph's who arrived in Toronto in the 19, 1850s. <clears throat> the sisters wanted a new home 
and they wanted it to be in harmony with the ravine following its uh, contour lines. They also wanted the most sustainable building they could afford, and that really spoke to their core values. Um, <clears throat> so in the end, we priced everything all the time. We actually ended up with uh, <clears throat> uh, geothermal for all of the heating and cooling for the building, cisterns, green roofs, and solar panels. For the project, we created a double, uh, a double loaded corridor in the center and two single loaded wings. <clears throat> And at every curve, uh, there's a series of communal spaces. <clears throat> and here's a view of the project when viewed from the Toronto, an aerial uh, looking at both the Toronto ravine and the project at the edge of a very uh, ordinary residential post-war neighborhood. <clears throat> and I would say the building defines the line between uh, the city and nature. Uh, the green piece you can see in the middle of the one of the curves is actually the chapel with its own green roof <laughs> and really the heart and soul of the building. Here's another view where you can see the way that the natural contours <clears throat> are being recalibrated and our understanding of both nature and the city, nature <clears throat> uh, its potential to really create this kind of edge between the, the city and the ravine. And here's a view of the green roof <clears throat> on the chapel, which is really the heart and soul of the building. And you can see it in relation to the skyline of the city beyond. <clears throat> so here's the kind of ground floor plan where we are using the kind of natural grade to create below level meeting rooms and then upper level rooms. And you can see the chapel, which is situated in a reflecting pool in the heart of the building. In the upper portion, you can see the role of the double loaded corridors and then the two single loaded corridors that really create in effect these urban porches. <clears throat> the front entrance, there was an 1850s residence on the site itself. Uh, when we first started the project, the sisters asked if we could move it or tear it down. It took about a year to convince them that we could keep the existing building, <clears throat> restore it and use it and incorporate it into our new uh, home for them. So here's a view of the main entrance <clears throat> and a kind of uh, the windows beyond are really this urban porch of these single loaded corridors. <clears throat> and then a view in winter. And we really always love to to photograph our buildings in winter to really give you a sense of this kind of <clears throat> seasonal experience. So you're seeing the 1850s house, the Taylor house on the right, <clears throat> and then you're seeing the kind of main facade of the building on the left. <clears throat> and here you can see uh, one of the reflecting pools uh, that we designed <clears throat> and the termination of a series of vertical sunshades that are Corten steel on the outside and a powder coated aluminum <clears throat> on the inside. And so in a way, this kind of articulation of the building envelope and creating both privacy, sun shading, and a kind of uh, image to the building. <clears throat> and here's a view again of the front entrance and on the driveway, there are about 64 geothermal pipes that go about 250 feet into the ground that give all the heating and cooling uh, for the building. <clears throat> And then a view from the city to the project in winter. And a view from one of the upper level urban porches <clears throat> to the neighborhood beyond. <clears throat> this is a view of the lobby, which is a really thin lobby. Uh, <clears throat> on the very far right, you see our what we call double, double peanut columns. <clears throat> They're kind of a shaped double column, a single column, <clears throat> uh, a reflecting pool, and then on the very far left is the edge of the chapel. And, and beyond the reflecting pool, you can see the Toronto Ravine beyond. This is one of the double loaded corridors that really are at the core of the building. <clears throat> A lot of the nursing stations and uh, um, uh, rehab uh, spaces are in the center. <clears throat> and then the single loaded corridors we conceive of as urban porches. They're full of natural light, they have operable windows, and they're full of views of the neighborhood. <clears throat> and in a way, we really see this project as a kind of model for long-term care. <clears throat> and these facilities uh, in Canada in particular were very hard hit at the beginning of <clears throat> the pandemic. Uh, <clears throat> and in a way, the kind of design of these spaces are ones where uh, you might want to live uh, later in life. Uh, 
<clears throat> each sister has a window looking both to the urban porch and also to the ravine. <clears throat> And then one of the things that we really spent a lot of time on was the, the chapel, which we really consider the heart and core of the building. So this is a plan where you can see the chapel surrounded by a reflecting pool, <clears throat> ramps that actually bring you up from the garden into the, the chapel space. And then here's the chapel shown in section. <clears throat> we actually did a step section to, so we create outdoor terraces and each floor in the project is different and has its own character. <clears throat> so this is the threshold to the chapel and you can see the reflecting pool beyond. And this is a view from the second floor of the chapel where we actually provided access from the more infirm, for the more infirm sisters to come directly from their rooms into the second floor of the chapel. These are the stations of the cross on pivoting uh, wood panels. And they brought these from their old monastery to this new home. <clears throat> and here's the double height space, which is really the kind of center of the chapel. And a view <clears throat> looking out to the landscape beyond. So this kind of role of water embracing you, the fact that you're really aware of nature <clears throat> and this push and pull between inside and outside. <clears throat> <clears throat> views of the structure and the kind of landscape beyond. Views of the reflecting pool, and this is the ramp that brings you up to the actual chapel from the outside. <clears throat> and then views at night, where really it becomes the heart and soul of the whole project. Um, <clears throat> this next project is actually a place called Point William, and this is a recent uh, publication uh, that we did, the architecture of Point William, a laboratory for living. <clears throat> and uh, one of the um, esteemed professors at Columbia, Kenneth Frampton, uh, wrote the text for it, along with Michael Webb from California. <clears throat> <clears throat> the project really begins by indicating the elements that are key to this part of Canada. This is a kind of view of the, on the left, a drawing of the, the sedimentary rock, the granite, <clears throat> and on the right, both a view of the found condition and then the granite gravel that we use throughout the project. <clears throat> this is a kind of uh, a mixed hardwood forest and you can see the role of logging. This whole area has been logged probably twice. And so we're never looking at a virgin forest. <clears throat> we're always looking at one that man has shaped through, through logging. And then the kind of lakes that are here, uh, this is a kind of underwater view of the, the elevation the, uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, of these lakes uh, in Muskoka and a view of the water itself. So these kind of elements that shape the project fundamentally. <clears throat> we were so fortunate that Ken Frampton was able to visit the site. And when he was there, he actually sketched uh, <clears throat> in his sketchbook to really start to understand the elements. And uh, so in our book, we actually published pieces of Ken's sketchbook. Uh, <clears throat> so here's the site plan on the right-hand side. And you can start to see these buildings that exist on the site and the new buildings that were added. So, so really when we say Point William, it's literally a point, a peninsula that juts into <clears throat> one of the lakes um, in the Muskokas. <clears throat> and then you're seeing, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, there's a, a boathouse, a guest cottage, a main house and a garage and a landscape that ties the whole thing together. So here's a view <clears throat> of this main rock. And one of the things that I think we uh, really did in the project was to remove things that were already there. There was a piece of an existing house that sat on top of this rock <clears throat> and we erased it to really reveal what is a really amazing natural landform. And then by edging it with the Corten steel, we actually allowed it to have a presence on the site. And then we used the same granite of the rock, but in a crushed form to create the sort of horizontal surface. <clears throat> And on the left-hand side are a series of Kenneth Frampton sketches that are starting to kind of dissect and uh, deconstruct the rock and the, the space. <clears throat> on the inside, we actually are <clears throat> creating indoor porches and are, are experimenting again with ceiling planes that go from the inside to the outside. We're working with very deep weathering steel fins that are shaping the project itself. 
<clears throat> and then we also uh, present in effect a series of Howard's charcoal drawings, uh, graphite drawings that are really part of the kind of image of the project, exploring its kind of identity within the Canadian landscape. So the first piece of, so this project actually extended over two decades. We didn't work on it for two decades. We're not that slow, but we actually did multiple buildings at different times. The first one was a boathouse. And here you can see a corner of the boathouse itself where we're combining in effect heavy timbers with uh, other uses of wood to create a level of plasticity within a, a wood architecture. <clears throat> this is a drawing on the left where you can see these underwater cribs that are done in the winter that create the infrastructure that, that everything sits on. So this kind of heavy, rugged <clears throat> underwater infrastructure allowing in effect these boathouses to exist over the water. <clears throat> and on the right hand side a view from the inside where we're using very fine one by fours of Douglas fir to create these shaped ceilings. And then here you're seeing a view of, um, on the right hand side, a steel column supporting a kind of wooden cantilever. So we're kind of combining in effect these hybrid conditions of wood and steel. And on the left hand side is actually a drawing where you can see the steel that's clad in wood, that's supporting a, a steel beam that's actually supporting a kind of wooden cantilever. And here's the light that I showed you earlier in its actual location. And then again, experiments. Uh, this was done about, this project was done quite a while ago, but you can see experiments in a uh, uh, bronze rod <clears throat> that actually reminds you of snowshoes or frames. And this kind of ongoing experiment at these multiple scales of hardware, of the spaces, and then of the landscape at the same time. We love doing drawings where here we're actually showing uh, both the plan of the docks where you can see two indoor boat slips, one outdoor boat slip, and then we're showing you the reflected ceiling plan of that space. And the RCP is always a really important drawing for us. It actually shapes spaces and, and that we're really interested in what the underside of the ceiling looks like as a way to, to uh, shape light to shape spaces at the same time. <clears throat> and then here you're seeing in effect the boathouse itself, <clears throat> the upper level. Uh, so one main room, uh, it's about 640 square feet. And then on the right hand side, you're seeing the reflected ceiling plan, both of the indoor and of the outdoor spaces. So in a way, I would say this is an early project, but one where we're, we're really experimenting with these possibilities. <clears throat> and I think that we continue that as we do these other buildings on the same site. So here's a view of the boathouse taken a while ago, but you're seeing in effect the entry of the boats uh, with these boat garages, covered outdoor spaces, indoor spaces, <clears throat> covered porches looking out to the landscape. And then again, this, these conditions of cantilevered portions that provide shading for outdoor boat slips as well as uh, outdoor terraces at the same time at the upper level. <clears throat> and then the view again, looking back of the kind of uh, hybrid structural conditions. The interior here. and then a view from the shoreline. Again, this kind of shift of scale uh, through winter. <clears throat> there was actually an existing cottage on the site. Uh, the image on the left in black and white is the before condition. <clears throat> and we could retain this on site, but we had to keep the silhouette, the footprint, and we could not alter <clears throat> uh, the kind of uh, uh, volume or the size of the building. So we actually, we actually consider this uh, renovation, an essay on the vernacular. Um, so on the right is the finished version, on the left is the before. <clears throat> and so here we are working with a very uh, normative plan for this area. So it's a core with a wrapper porch. <clears throat> on the left, you're seeing the plan. And on the right, you're seeing the reflected ceiling plan. And the reflected ceiling plan, you can see the core of the building. <clears throat> and then the porch, which is articulated with uh, exposed uh, uh, rafters uh, on the perimeter. And then here's a view <clears throat> of it from the outside. And you can see the expression of the underside of the ceiling outside that extends inside. 
And here's a view of that same building and the entire exterior is clad in, in a stacked wood, which is very common for this area. A lot of wood burning stoves and using stacked wood and making sure it's protected. So that all of the uh, sloping roofs and horizontal surfaces are all done in weathering steel. And you can see this big rock in the foreground. The main building, which is called a cottage, but maybe bigger than what most people would think is a cottage, <clears throat> has a series of these uh, deep corken steel clad fins, which go from outside to inside. <clears throat> and <they're clears throat> this is a view from the point of Point William, <clears throat> and you can see it's clad in wood and bronze uh, and uh, stone at the base. And you can see it situated at the point and the relationship between the existing granite rock and the building is really key and important. <clears throat> and then an aerial view uh, where you're seeing the green roofs and the kind of wooden roofs and the metal roofs. And you can actually see that big rock on the upper portion of this image. A view from the water looking back and you can see the way that uh, some of the pieces of wood, uh, the wood cladding is actually transparent uh, and it becomes a way to let light into the project. Um, and then in elevation, you can see the relationship of the natural topography to the line of the house. And on the right-hand side, you're seeing these deep wooden, uh, deep corten steel fins, and then the base being stone and then wood above. <clears throat> and then this is the entry where you're seeing a series of granite steps uh, clad in bronze. And then you're also seeing the door handle that was designed for the project. And you're seeing these deep corten steel fins that really shape your experience once you're inside. <clears throat> Here are some of the door handles that we designed, but you can see that the shape of the ceiling of the interior and the shape of the door handles have a resonance. And we're kind of always playing with these multiple scales at the same time. <clears throat> a view of the living room where you're seeing the upper portion being exposed, uh, <clears throat> windows bringing light in, and then a view looking out in the middle of winter. So this kind of changing landscape that we really uh, love to kind of capture these multiple seasons that our projects exist in. <clears throat> this is the plan where you can see in effect a core uh, there's an entry porch in the upper portion of the plan, the main living space, and then a core of bedrooms. So there's kind of like these intimate, uh, <clears throat> in effect, contained rooms and very expansive rooms and the relationship between the two. And then again, the reflected ceiling plan of the same area where you can see the shaping of the ceiling to really articulate each of the rooms that are there. <clears throat> and then a section where you can see the kind of shaped ceiling of the living room and these other pieces and its relationship to the natural topography. So here we are at the entry. <clears throat> and then you can see these very deep fins on the right hand side. <clears throat> and the way that as you move along, they both frame views <clears throat> and they sh shape views in a very cinematic way. And then this kind of shaping of some of the ceilings that really create in effect these uh, porches and rooms that you articulate in plan, the ceiling actually allows you to shape spatially. <clears throat> and then the ceiling also allows you to bring light and shape the way that light enters the spaces. And here's a view in winter where you can see the way that the slow winter sun angle really brings the light right into the project of you looking back to both the dining and the kind of fireplace area. <clears throat> and then looking out towards the lake. And again, the kind of shaped ceilings of the living space. <clears throat> and in this case, we were able to design um, uh, through 3D printed uh, metal, uh, all of the fireplace equipment. And, and so in a way they become part of this kind of scale of industrial design that becomes part of the architecture. <clears throat> the last project that I wanted to share with you um, is the ACE Hotel in Toronto. <clears throat> um, so we've been working on this project for a while <clears throat> and it should be opening in the spring of 2022 this year. 
<clears throat> unfortunately, they were uh, delayed by uh, some of the pandemic. So they've been locked down twice <clears throat> and the construction site had to be closed and then reopened again. Um, but they're anticipating um, May of this year to be the opening of the new hotel. <clears throat> and the hotel is situated in downtown Toronto in a neighborhood of these red brick warehouse buildings that were so ubiquitous and part of the <clears throat> urban uh, sort of uh, garment district in Toronto. And Toronto is a city of red bricks. <clears throat> and um, you can see a variety of them in this photo. <clears throat> and so we really began by, by wanting to create a fabric building. Uh, here's some very early sketches, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, thinking about the facade. <clears throat> And then it's also located across from a public park. <clears throat> uh, it's called St. Andrew's Playground, which is one of the oldest parks in Toronto. <clears throat> and so you can see our building and it's a 14 story building, but we're also playing with this double scale. So each of the bays <clears throat> in the elevation is actually two stories. And we wanted to kind of shift the reading of scale and maybe be not really, uh, really at the, and using the kind of robust depth of many of the industrial buildings to be part of the project. <clears throat> and so here's some early drawings where we're looking at the brick facade. And again, you can see this double scale, the horizontal band <clears throat> between <clears throat> within each of the bays is actually a spandrel panel. And there are actually two floors of the hotel within it with a kind of <clears throat> a more glazed lower level. So here you can see a view uh, looking down the street and we really wanted it to feel like an urban building within the fabric of Toronto using red brick and, and actually uh, you know, building it with the very ordinary building material of our city. <clears throat> and then here's a view, uh, a, a drawing of the corner of the building. I would say in Toronto, we actually make decent buildings, but really bad corners. <laughs> and so this is trying to capture uh, one street, Brant Street, uh, uh, looking onto the park and Camden Street, and really articulating and shaping the corner. <clears throat> uh, this is a view of the north facade with the entrance and ramps bringing up luggage into the space <clears throat> and the exposed steel beams that are part of the exterior. And this is a really early study model where we're looking at a series of large poured in place concrete beams that become the transfer beams from the hotel floors above to the lobby of the hotel below. <clears throat> and we kept all of this structure exposed uh, <clears throat> to become part of the experience of the lobby space. Uh, so this is a very early study model. <clears throat> These are some early drawings. So again, the role of drawing being fundamental to how we practice and how we think about architecture. <clears throat> and so here you can see the kind of poured in place frame. And then the lobby is actually slid in into the space itself and actually hung by uh, rods uh, from this, this main superstructure of this poured in place concrete. Here's some early study models, again, looking at the view of the lobby, looking out to the public park, St. Andrew's Playground, beyond. <clears throat> this is a view of one of the hotel rooms, <clears throat> and we conceived of them as urban cabins. So there's all Douglas fir, <clears throat> and uh, we actually used canvas on the walls uh, <clears throat> to really create a kind of intimate space within the heart of the city. <clears throat> and then some construction photos that really give you a sense of uh, <clears throat> what the site looked like. Uh, so, so here we are looking, uh, this was, these were taken about three days ago. <clears throat> so here's actually the view of the kind of uh, <clears throat> at the, near the entrance. And you can see the piece on the left that's projecting out is actually the, <clears throat> the lobby. And you can see the rods that are supporting it from the kind of uh, poured in place concrete frames. Here's a view uh, from the lobby looking back to the park, and you can see these large scale knuckles that we designed. <clears throat> Here's a view of the main space. So all those are poured in place concrete uh, <clears throat> with steel that's part of the formwork. And um, we wanted the space to be, you, you not, you, we wanted the space to feel civic. <clears throat> we wanted you to not be certain whether it was a new building or an existing building. And this question of time becomes a kind of part of the experience of the space. <clears throat> Another view of the kind of knuckles. Um, 
<clears throat> and uh, the kind of uh, from the other end, looking back at the space <clears throat> uh, under construction, the stairs where the treads are articulated and the rods are actually holding up this part of the stair. <clears throat> And then a final view looking back. <clears throat> so within a world of placelessness, we really remain committed to placemaking. So whether it is urban or non-urban, <clears throat> and for us, crafting place is at the core of our body of work and crafting place results from the interweaving of building and site. Thank you so much. So I'm gonna stop share. If we were all together, Bridget, we'd hear we'd hear lots of applause. Thank you so much for your Thank talk. Thank you. Yeah. So, I want to start by zooming way out from uh, after having really enjoyed the many scales uh, of your of your work, and just just way out to the sort of national scale for a moment. Um, so, Canada has 37 million people, about one ninth of the U.S., but it basically has the economy the size of Texas. Um, and while Canada is just barely within the ten, the list of ten richest countries, uh, you know GDP per capita is still, uh, or purchasing power parity is lower than the than the U.S., which effectively means that Canadians are a little bit poorer. You know things are a bit more expensive for Canadians. Um, you know that's that said, uh, Canadian cities like your hometown consistently rank or score much higher than U.S. cities in the global livability rankings, which you're probably all very proud of. Um, you know. Why? Because of great education, public health system, good job market, lower crime. So I'm wondering, with the many sort of cultural and economic ties between the US and Canada, um, still each other's biggest trading partners, right? We could be forgiven for sort of forgetting that, that, that we're different, that, we're, that they're different. And but what I, my question is, what makes practicing architecture in Canada different for you? What makes your work, uh, if not necessarily uniquely Canadian, uniquely possible in Canada? Hmm. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I would say the we've been very lucky to work with amazing clients <clears throat> and you and we have lots of very low budget small scale projects as well as larger projects. Um, <clears throat> I would say projects like the Point William project that we showed <clears throat> was actually done over two decades. The client was trained as an architect, <clears throat> but didn't practice architecture and being able to really experiment with on the same site for two decades is just an amazing opportunity. One building, the next building, the next building over this kind of long span. <clears throat> we actually work with the same contractors for to build all four buildings on the site and to do the landscape. <clears throat> so within a kind of very um, complex uh, procurement process for architects. So most architects have to submit RFPs and RFQs and they run after every project. <clears throat> In a way, projects like Point William just allow us to really experiment. You know, uh, I don't think we did a change order for any of the four projects that we did, uh, <clears throat> but we can, But we work with super great craftsmen who are all from the local area. <clears throat> and we work with people in the Toronto and combine so many different things. So this ability to experiment is really hard and really tough. <clears throat> and I think that where you can have the opportunities to really uh, uh, just try a lot of things and, and uh, uh, explore, you know, what is what is craft? Like that, that's an interesting question. And how do you define that? <clears throat> how do you define that in a super low budget project? And how mm -hmm. do you define that in a <clears throat> higher end project? I think that those are really important questions. Yeah. And <clears throat> the kind of, so, so architecture has become so streamlined and mainstream. <clears throat> and I feel like we always try to uh, step out of that. Mm -hmm. and uh, work, you know, often with pretty tough budgets, like really like low, low, when I say low, they're really low, <clears throat> but then to find ways of being inventive within those norms <clears throat> and to really get away from this kind of mainstream approach where you're specifying, you know, Conier or, you yeah. know, whatever the system is. <clears throat> So when you specify those things, they control everything. They but, control the warranty, they control yeah. everything. And so you have little room for invention, for experimentation. Yeah, you're basically shopping. Yeah, exactly. but, but but I would say that's something that you know the U.S. and Canada may, may maybe share. And I've read that your approach to this question of industry is not so much an act of res resistance as insistence, is at least the way that <laughs> <laughs> which I enjoyed. And there's so much uh, discussion uh, around your work um, 
you know, that centered on the issue of craft versus industry. And, and I noticed in your early projects, like you didn't show it today, but the laneway house, um, as you say, that even with lower budgets, you know, you bring craft to your work with concrete block, for instance. Um, but in Point Williams, uh, one of your later projects, right, where your client famously said that they gave you an unlimited budget and you exceeded it. <laughs> mm. um, so at what point, Bridget, do you decide it's worth it to, to, to make something or just buy something? And you alluded to that. You know, at what point, especially when you do have a modest budget, do you just buy it? Or, and what happens when uh, a doorknob breaks? And do you have a service contract to think about <laughs> maintenance? <laughs> you know, you know, do, do they call you up? <laughs> but I would say that, you know, one of the things I was trying to show was some of the lighting pieces. We love this kind of uh, off the shelf and customized <clears throat> and how to bring the two together. So you take something that's super ordinary and so ubiquitous and how you combine that with something else actually makes something new. And this kind of play between the kind of everyday regular and then the custom for us is super interesting because it just allows a level of uh, <clears throat> kind of pushing and pulling and kind of reinventing with the kind of everyday pieces of life. And uh, so we're always really uh, <clears throat> interested in exploring those things. And so this kind of multi-scalar approach uh, <clears throat> I think really helps us with, with really low budget projects because we can be very discerning about where to put your effort. <clears throat> you, don't, you don't do it everywhere, but where mm. you do it, it really counts and uh, it really matters. Let's expand on this a little. Um, you mentioned basically, <clears throat> well, I guess you're referring to a kind of a vernacular as well, like that there is this kind of connection to the everyday or the known types. Um, but it, uh, the question of influence, which I find usually to be quite limiting, uh, it can be very kind of reductive, um, but and maybe there's a ghost of modernism in, in, it, in our rejecting the topic, but you're, you and Howard have, have positioned your practice uh, in reference to other architects. You, you gamely and you know, speak about that with candor. And I, so I find that very interesting and maybe th therefore it's possible to ask you about this, but I mean, um, you know, how do you describe the dialogue that you, you, you do have with, I mean, we've mentioned Alto and Scarpa, but I would like to just also propose that Charot, Pierre Charot and, and Plechnik are, I, I see, oh, yeah. you know, as, as very kind of, and those are also favorites of mine as well, or one can even say Wittgenstein with his uh, doorknobs. Hardware and, obsession. Hardware obsession, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> it, you know, if we think about architects like, um, the late Enrique Miralles, who would uh, engage in a dialogue with, uh, buildings that that he would double uh otro mas he would say and <laughs> another one and he would he and his uh, former partner Carmen Pinos would take a building and basically duplicate it in, in you know in their own way I'm curious what is the dialogue specifically you know between your work and 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 this larger you know larger framework but even specifically your you know your, your residence for the Sisters of St. Joseph and Alvar Alto's Baker House MIT, <clears throat> MIT. yeah so I would say, um, I would say we feel like we're part of the modernist project, uh, and I would say that there, I would say all of the architects that you mentioned, I mean, I would consider mentors, uh, and we've actually traveled to see all those buildings. You know, we've been to Finland many times, and to actually physically see those spaces, to be in those buildings is just a kind of architectural education. So we all went to architecture school, but we all need to be educated as architects. <clears throat> and uh, I would say that, you know, the kind of canonical architects like the, you know, Mies and Korb, I actually only discovered later <laughs> that I love their work <clears throat> coming around. Uh, and I would say that we, you know, we ended up um, early in our architectural, after we graduated, I received a Canada Council grant from Canada Council, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we used it to travel to uh, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. <clears throat> and uh, I actually, we actually saw so much amazing work. It was a, re a really early in our career, and I would say it was so formative for us to actually go to see all that work. <clears throat> uh, we actually <clears throat> saw Sarah Fenn's work uh, really early on, and. Uh, ended up speaking at his 80th birthday symposium like many years later. And that was the first time we had met him, but we felt we already knew him because we had seen the projects, we had visited the work, we'd done our sketches there. <clears throat> and so I feel like there's such a kind of remarkable body of built work to be always learning from. And one of the things I lament because I teach 
to students of architecture is sometimes people figure like I've seen it on Instagram. So I actually know mm -hmm. what the building is like and you have no idea about what the spaces are like to be in. You don't really have a sense of the context, the physicality of you know what is a forest, how big is it? <clears throat> All those things really shape your understanding of architecture. <clears throat> and you just have to go there. You can't, mm -hmm. nothing replicates it. Sometimes a, a monograph is great because it's fulsome, but it still doesn't replicate the act of actually experiencing buildings in space and time. <clears throat> and yeah. so I feel like that's been fundamental to our education. <clears throat> yeah. And I think you're in awe of these amazing architects who did so many incredible things, right? Like uh, Plechnik and uh, yeah. every, all the people that you mentioned <clears throat> are just really um, super inspiring and uh, so masterful. Let's let's speak about the forest for a minute. I was struck by the images of the forest in Moscow, um, and I'm, I think you know generally when your work is written about, you know, of course one speaks about the different scales of your work and the the different details, um, and it is amazing how you you know, bring such focus to all these skills. I confess that I felt like Alice in Wonderland falling through the looking glass and or it, finding myself very small inside a cabinet as I as I read your Point Williams book. Um, and there's a funny moment, I don't know if you noticed this, Bridget, when you were hovering your mouse over the screen, this auto description automatically generated kept on popping up. And the computer, I guess, in your screen thought that uh, Point Williams was, quote, a boat traveling along a body of water. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, was very, it, was, it was very funny. Um, but, you know, your houses, I guess, approach uh, the idea of a total work of architecture. And this, this has been written. And here we are reminded, of, of course, of Frank Lloyd Wright. But I, I want to speak more about the way you treat different disciplines. Um, you know, you, the landscape, for instance, um, on the one hand, it seems as if the landscape, you know, or, or an urban in the urban conditions you build in the urban context is your main literal reference material. You look at the landscape, the bark of the trees, the, you know, whatever it is. And then somehow when you do a Google search of your works, uh, I see whites and browns, the cortens, the, you know, the woods, and there's this palette punctuated by, by certain colors, but ultimately it looks as if the landscape is your driving kind of inspiration, but also your, your agency, you, you know, you even use the word palette when describing a site as if the natural conditions are already yours to manipulate. So, but my question is more about the disciplinary aspect. I mean, you, you've written that quote, and I, here I quote you, that you believe that the perceived boundaries between the disciplines of architecture, landscape and urban design, visual art and forestry are artificial. Um, I think you're giving some advice to students in the future. I found that very, very powerful, but how are you able to do it all? How are you able to you know, expand practice and deal with all of it? And you know, at what point do you step back and just call up a, a, a specialist that you orchestrate? <clears throat> so we work with lots of specialists, uh, you know, and in a way, you know, we, we, we work with huge teams, like, you know, with the Sisters Project, we had 40 consultants, so like everyone else, you know, we have landscape architects, uh, we work with horticulturalists, we work with a whole army of people, <clears throat> but I feel like this kind of, um, I guess maybe the thing I resist or kind of is this kind of professionalism. So there's kind of like a boundary of what do landscape architects do? And it's kind of like defined with a dotted line. And what do architects do? <clears throat> and what do interior designers do? <clears throat> and I guess I'm so uninterested in the professional boundaries <clears throat> because I feel that they're totally arbitrary. And when you experience space, all these canonical projects that we were talking about that, <clears throat> you know, most of those architects were transitional figures between classicism and modernism. They actually knew classicism extremely well. And they had to then make the shift to redefine their work through modernism. So interesting, such an amazing time period <clears throat> to be alive. <clears throat> and I would say that one of the things that we, we think about are this, are this how you move in space through space between inside and outside. And we want to create rich spatial experiences. And we don't really care if you're an architect or a landscape architect or interior, like those, it's actually about how you create and shape space that matters and how you move between inside and outside that's really important. And to do that, you need to think 
about the landscape and you need to think about a door handle and you need to think about all these things that constitute a rich spatial experience. <laughs> so we, so we, we work with landscape architects and we work with horticulturalists, but we don't call ourselves landscape architects, but we, but we think very deeply about mm. all of these things. I'm, I'm reminded by uh, an essay uh, by James Corner in which he articulates the difference between la the word landscape and, and Landschaft in, ger in German, where landscape comes from the English uh, tradition of painting and scape of course it comes from vision mm -hmm, whereas, yeah. whereas Landschaft comes from work working the land and sort of the, the uh, already long emerged distinction between the different modes of sort of thinking about and producing landscape I mean it's become so much more complex now uh, with mm -hmm. environmental issues resilience and so on I mean I, I wonder at what point does your disciplinary limit is, is, it, is it reached and as you scale up you know you have to kind of not let go, but sort of layer on sort of different kinds of thinking about, you know, about landscape. Um, so when in uh, the project in Moscow, um, partway through the client thought we should just add a few lakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so they added a few lakes. And so we ended up designing uh, pedestrian bridges crossing over the lakes. And uh, so in a way, I just think that, you know, those are really interesting questions for us and really interesting dimensions that uh, we really love to explore and mm -hmm. uh, investigate. So yeah. I have one more question for you, Bridget, and then uh, uh, audience, please uh, post questions in the chat. And I see that there's one already, and uh, which I'll, I'll read in a minute. But um, so our dear Ken Frampton uh, wrote in writing about your residence for the Sisters of St. Joseph of Toronto in an issue of Canadian Architect wrote, quote, there's a crucial moment in the maturation of any practice when the size and the genre of the commission suddenly shift. This usually constitutes an opportunity to amplify a particular approach at a larger scale. At the same time, this shift presents a syntactical and ideological challenge to the architect since such a change usually involves a move from the domestic to the public scale. So it's impossible to focus on, on the same things regardless of scale, obviously. And, and Pierre Charot is basically famous for one house. Um, so do you, do you enjoy working at larger scales? And what are the social or even political aspects of this transition? <clears throat> um, so I would say the hotel in Toronto is about the same scale as the sisters, <clears throat> but it's you know 14 stories as opposed to kind of you know four stories spread out. Uh, <clears throat> so I feel like it's, I find it a really interesting challenge to shift scales. And it is really a challenge. Like I think, just because you can do a house, you, it doesn't mean you can't you can do a larger building, and vice versa. Like I mean, there's certain architects where they probably shouldn't do a house, but large scale is actually perfect for them. Uh, we actually like the challenge of that shift, but then again, it has to be the right thing in the right place. So for the hotel, <clears throat> you know, we really wanted it to be an urban fabric building, and and uh, <clears throat> for it, for it to be about carved spaces. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, so, so I feel like it's a um, uh, something that you know we we love the challenge of these kind of different scales of uh, of uh, uh, inhabitation of the spaces to thinking about how they are experienced spatially. Uh, and uh, you know, it's not like we want to just only do one thing. I think we enjoy the kind of uh, variety. We have a question from the audience, which maybe uh, connects to this, Brigitte from Samuel Baker. Thanks for your question. I was able to visit Point William this past summer while back in Muskoka and was blown away by the consistency and architectural gestures and aesthetic across all the structures at this cottage property. How do you begin to approach a project of this scale with so many different buildings and elements? Everything from a full-scale cottage to a boathouse to even down to landscaping door handles. Was it difficult to go back to this project after 20 years and design more buildings on the same site? Did you have to alter your approach? It's a good question. So that's a good question. And, and then very rarely do you actually get to work on the same. So I would say this kind of question of placemaking <clears throat> is a blip in the geological history, like it's just puny. Uh, but for us, the opportunity to kind of have a really early project like the boathouse and then come back to the site 10 years later and to do a kind of vernacular building and then to come back a five years later and to do these other pieces was really great. Um, uh, it was the fact that we could have kind of like a resonance or an echoing. Uh, I would not say replicating, but I would say this kind of, you know, uh, this exploration of color, the role of lighting, this kind of material transformation from an early building built right over the water to a building on granite rock. Uh, and then the ability, as I described, to erase pieces 
and reveal and in, through erasure revealing part of the landscape that was kind of already there. And so maybe that's maybe the more powerful act of anything to kind of remove to reveal mm -hmm. is kind of a pretty amazing thing. <laughs> and maybe by having the time to understand the site is when you have the opportunity to do something like that. If you're in and out really fast and you're kind of like, a, mm -hmm. in a way, I just think this maturation, <laughs> just a, an interesting note is um, Architecture Magazine commissioned a photographer named Ed Bertinsky to photograph the boathouse in 1999 <clears throat> and um, since then Ed's gone on to do amazing things and films <clears throat> and our client commissioned him to photograph Point William <clears throat> uh, two years ago so he came back 20 oh. years later to the same site and so some of those crazy drone shots or ones yeah, from yeah. the water are all Ed's shots taken you know sort of 20 years after he shot the boathouse so you're seeing yeah. this kind of two decade uh, a period and he shot the boathouse all in film like you know film right <laughs> and he shot everything else digitally and and he kind of uh, speaks about the kind of difference of you know photography and its technology in this 10-year time period which so is the, interesting. the project is a kind of measure of, of both your work and 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 it his is, yeah. and I guess one could again invoke Plechnik in thinking about the success of you know uh, insertions within Prague Castle mm -hmm. um, another different question as uh, has the pandemic from Ben Carr, has the pandemic changed the workflow in your studio or with construction administration in an unexpected, unexpectedly positive ways? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I would say negative and positive. So we have had construction lockdown. So the hotel was actually supposed to be open two years ago. And, uh, you know, they're working away, you know, every time you have a lockdown, uh, the site loses all its trades, they go on to do other things, and you have to reassemble them. So that those kinds of delays are really hard. Uh, <clears throat> um, but I think I think I interpret the question to be specific to your practice of construction administration, you know, the <laughs> present the press physical presence that I think your work needs. Yeah, yeah. So so it's been so that's been tricky to not be on site. <laughs> and uh, so we actually haven't visited our project in Moscow for a while. Uh, we actually are planning to go in February, but we're- Good, good luck with that. <laughs> I don't know what's gonna happen. I have no idea. Uh, so it's been, it's been hard. Uh, the kind of, you know, like many firms, we've had to have people work at home and uh, had to deal with all of that stuff, which has been challenging. And, you know, our cult there's an office culture, a studio culture that I think all of you, you know, your office probably has as well, Eric, that's kind of really <clears throat> very intense and intimate. And it's really, you know, I think people have done really well by working uh, at home, but it doesn't replicate being in the same space. So I think that's really tricky. As we wait for potential other questions, I, I just wanted to ask you about the fact that you're now working uh, abroad, where after having really worked for a very long time, in, only in Canada, maybe with the exception of Maine, I guess, uh, now I understand uh, not only Moscow, but Hong Kong and Hawaii, um, you know, with, for architects who are so connected to place, how do you know that you're interpreting uh, mm -hmm. a, Mos a Moscow forest, uh, or does it matter, you know, that mm -hmm. you're interpreting mm -hmm. it in a certain way? Well, I mean, I think that the first few images was trying to kind of talk about <clears throat> doing work that is not in your own backyard and what you need to do to think about these issues, not only of, you know, place and <clears throat> the kind of, uh, you know, tree species, but also methods of fabrication, right? <clears throat> so we actually worked not only, we worked with a pretty international team of fabricators, a lot of them, you know, uh, from Bolzano, from Germany, but we also work with a lot of Russian fabricators. We actually got to use Google Translate a lot between Russian and English. And, uh, and actually, you know, I think it's been really interesting that there's a whole, you know, a uh, group of Russian fabricators that we did, you know, pedestrian bridges and undersides of soffits and all a lot of custom uh, <clears throat> metal work that uh, they had never done before. Uh, so again, we would use full-size mock-ups, they would build it, we would approve it, they would do a patch, you know, and, and we would exchange shop drawings <clears throat> and then Google Translate and then ask a bunch of questions, circle different things. And, you know, we just had to work together with them <clears throat> using pretty similar tools than we would with a, a fabricator <clears throat> in North America. Um, but, you know, the kind of, there's a time delay, distance, all that stuff, but some pretty amazing mm -hmm. work that came out of it. And uh, I think it really has helped to build a kind of culture of that 
a, a finer level stuff that didn't exist. You know, it was really hard to find people to do that mm -hmm. stuff there. So maybe one last question, Brigitte. Um, maybe speak to the students. Uh, are you optimistic about architecture? No. Oh, I think so. In a way, one of the things I was really trying to show is, you know, uh, we, you know, uh, people in our studio use Rhino to do 3D <coughs> shaping <coughs> door handles and all kinds of custom things. We ship it off to Safe uh, Shapeways. <coughs> you know, we get a little little box back. <laughs> we look at it. We it's check broken. It out. <laughs> you know, back and forth, back and forth. Like, how amazing is that? Like, we don't actually need to own all this fancy equipment. <clears throat> it's actually way better for us just to kind of, you know, go to those guys. They can tell us how much does it cost in plastic? How much does it cost in stainless steel? How much does it cost in bronze? <clears throat> and we can use it as a really great way of being so direct in mm. actually making pieces that are prototypes. <clears throat> uh, sometimes we actually use it to kind of create a batch, like a small run of things. Uh, so that so the so we actually don't do computer renderings. We don't use computers in that way in our studio, but we do use it for all of this making stuff <clears throat> that is so great. And and as young architects, those are totally at your disposal. So easy to do. <clears throat> and you know all the programs. Everyone in architecture, every architecture school is so dexterous at. So what an what a great time to be an architecture student <clears throat> when you have all of this ability to kind of create things and to see them physically fabricated uh, just like that and and really inexpensively. Like you know, and I think of what mm. it would cost for a craftsman to make any one of the things that we <clears throat> you know just push a button and three D print out. So there's clearly a lot of time in Rhino doing all the programs, shaping them, refining them for sure but the actual mm. making of it becomes a different thing and and we're always combining in effect the handmade with these kind of uh, fabricated pieces it's never just about the slick fabrication it's actually about again i was mm. trying to explain in the very first project that's unfinished this kind of the handmade brick and then the precision of the weathering steel yeah, horizontal the elements so kind of precise <clears throat> and the two together become the thing you're creating. It's a bit like our interest in high and low and ready-made versus kind of fabricated. Mm -hmm. um, I did say that was my last question, but you, you made me think that, uh, just to say one thing about your work that um, it, I guess is pretty consistent is the articulation and uh, of, of, of pieces uh, of elements, especially the frame in section, uh, I would say, but um, you know, the joint. Um, and unitized construction seems to be the kind of the, the dominant, uh, you know, of course you use concrete and so on, but I think there's a, a counter balance maybe with the ambiguity that I think you're looking for between materials uh, like weathering steel and wood uh, where, you know, they kind of start to read together, especially in the Point Williams house. But thanks so much for your uh, note of confidence and ambiguity, I'm uh, oh, sorry, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and optimism. Uh, that you shared with us uh, today and, and your, your beautiful work. Um, so thank you, Bridget, for coming to GSAP. Great, thank you so much for the invitation and I look forward to coming back in person sometime when uh, and doing reviews for you guys. So thank you so forward much. To it. Okay, yeah, bye great. all. Thanks everyone, see you soon. Bye, yeah, thanks Eric, uh, bye. -bye. bye. Take, take yeah. care, bye-bye. Yeah.